Uh, once again, my name is Arisha Hatch. I'm the Managing Director at Color of Change. I just want to thank um, Professor Rose and the Center for inviting me here today to speak. Um, Color of Change is the country's largest online black civil rights organization with close to a million members. Uh, we are founded in the wake of Hurricane Katrina um, and, have, and do campaign work uh, that ranges from criminal justice work to economic justice work, as well as media accountability work. Um, today I'm here to talk to you about our media program, represent.colorofchange.org, um, uh, uh, and I'm happy to be here to do that. Uh, the reason that Color of Change decided to launch a media program was because we saw uh, in a very real way how media was influencing the other campaign work that we were trying to do in other areas. We live in a world that is oftentimes hostile towards black people, a world where black people are routinely denied the benef benefit of the doubt. We see this hostility played out in places like Ferguson, Missouri and Sanford, Florida, where the taking of black lives doesn't result in proper investigations by the police or timely arrests, um, where the murder of unarmed youth are justified by unreasonable, unwarranted fears. We see this hostility played out in our economic policies, racially charged campaigns to drug test welfare recipients and cut food stamps. Uh, we see this hostility in our everyday lives, in the culture of our everyday lives, trying to rent an apartment or hail a cab or shop in department stores or apply for a loan. Uh, and although black people are fighting every day for that benefit of the doubt, we also do, we do so in the face of a television media culture that continues to reproduce this hostility, this culture of hostility. Here is just a quick snapshot of how black people are currently represented on television today. You are, you are a dumb call. Like, Shut up. Yeah, you want to hear me? You are. I will get you up. I will get you up. No, 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 the review's first line reads, quote, when Shonda Rhimes writes her autobiography, it should be called How to Get Away with Being an Angry Black Woman. Black history, our forefathers paved the way. Here's 28 reasons to hug a black guy today. Number one, we deserve a chance. Two through 28, slavery. We are now hearing from the notorious owner of the L.A. Clippers, Donald Sterling. You don't think that. You know I'm not a racist. How to get away with murder. Here we go. Trapped inside of every white girl is a strong black woman ready to bust out. No self-respecting black woman would ever hide herself in this if she wants to keep a black car. Did I not raise you for better? How many times have I told you you have to be what? Twice. What? Twice as good. Twice as good as them to get half what they have. Richard Sherman is getting all the attention with an epic rant. When you try me with a sorry receiver like Crabtree, that's the result you're gonna get. Don't you ever talk about me. I think he needs some anger management cords, this Andy. <laughs> we can do it. Let's do it now, Rich. Let's do it. Come on, Rich. Let's do it. Come on, Rich. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do Somebody got love for their Lord and Savior. Oh. Baby, that's Jesus. Back in the slave days, my love life would have been way better. Master would have hooked me up with the best brother on the plantation. <laughs> and every nine months, I'd be in the corner having a super baby. This right. woman knows that young girls getting pregnant in the African-American community now, it's about 70% out of wedlock. She knows and doesn't seem to care, Ebony. That's my problem well, with her. 
Let me finish my point before you talk. Okay, let, let me let get, finish I my point address, before you talk. I want to address can something I finish you my said. Point? Then we you, don't yeah. have to have an interview okay. if I can't okay. talk. This is the scene, rather, from Sunday night when looters were going from store to store, taking merchandise, everything from tire rims to athletic shoes. All those charged face felony burglary charges with bonds set at $50,000. I'm an American. I'm not an African-American. I'm an American. Listen up. I'm going to need my family to be black, not black-ish. So what is the new black? The new black doesn't blame other races for our issues. I'm about to go on air. Okay, here's how we angle it. Black women aren't ugly. We're invisible. Nobody cares about that story I anymore. care. I have a niece that wants to do porn. Porn. You know, there's a whole, there's a complete double standard and a complete different experience that a certain element of this country gets, has the privilege of being treated like human beings and other, and, and the rest of us are not treated like human beings, period. And that needs to be discussed. That is the story. The clips we just saw paint us a pretty good picture of a single year um, of black representation on TV. Uh, obviously, uh, black representations differ slightly than uh, the Latino media gap, media gap that we just heard described. Um, for us, it's less about invisibility um, and more about how those representations um, uh, uh, how those representations influence people's Im implicit biases about black people. Um, I know those images are a lot to take in, but Olivia Pope notwithstanding, Mary Jane Paul notwithstanding, Annalise Keating notwithstanding, we still repeatedly see scenarios, representations, and stereotypes that are harmful and that are actually training people day in and day out how to perceive and interact with black folks and the expectations that they should have for black folks. Television is powerful in that way. Um, it can educate us to overcome prejudice or it can teach people to perpetuate stereotypes that contribute to that discrimination. For some people, their deepest relationship with black people is, um, is the relationship that they have with black characters or individuals on television. When TV shapes inaccurate and stereotypical perceptions about black people over and over again, we see the impact of those perceptions spilling into the real world, scenarios that define so much of the black experience in the real world, in school classrooms, in doctor's offices, in banks, in job interviews, wherever, and of course in the criminal justice system. And it doesn't matter whether uh, people at the studios and production houses intend this real world harm to be, it, to be the effect or not. It, this is the impact, this is the harm. So how exactly is TV contributing to real world consequences for black people? How are people learning not to give black people the benefit of the doubt? There's a whole system of harm at play and we've delineated this various actors in the system to inform our campaign strategies. Uh, the first actor in this um, scenario are producers. These are the people at TV networks or at production studios who are actually creating or approving harmful content. They could be network executives or directors or writers, but they all play some role in making media happen. Next, we have the vehicles, the actual media vehicles. A, vehicles could be, a vehicle could be a specific television show or a certain kind of character type or trope, the sexy Latina, the angry black woman, the thug. These are all vehicles of misrepresentation. Those vehicles um, then um, form perceptions in people's minds about black people. A perception might be that black people are unjustifiably angry um, and inherently violent. We, uh, we saw that in the Richard Sherman clip, in the Real Housewives in Love and Hip Hop clips, in the coverage of Ferguson. The idea is spread across reality programs, scripted programs, news media, but somewhere along the line, someone decided it was okay to run programming that pushes this idea. Research shows that those perceptions actually drive decision making by black people, other people, and white people. And so these, those decisions lead to real world impacts. Black people bear the burden of all these unfair dehumanizing media portrayals and the treatment they face um, every day that sends a message that you'll never be given the benefit of the doubt. Um, some of the things we talked about earlier, employment rejection, clearly harsher sentences, harsher treatment in the justice system and by law enforcement. The impact is felt in job interviews, in the classroom, in the courtroom, and in our neighborhoods. It's everywhere. 
And so this is our, we um, frequently re refer to this as our theory of harm. Um, and we, we can identify this clear progression of media production and impact, which, in, which, which results in clear harm for black people. Uh, but that's, there, that's not it. Uh, this, there's another part of this arc. Um, and right now we're sort of talking about this arc in the context of how dehumanizing media gets made, but it also applies for pushing responsible media through the system. Um, you can see sort of on the front end, there are, it's sort of starting with social structures. There are social structures in our society that go back to before the founding of this country, um, from problems around capitalism itself to white supremacy and so on. Um, but whatever those social structures are, that whole cold culture we live in privileges certain kinds of motives. Um, pro a profit motive, for example, would be one motive. We think of profit motive when we think about the media industry because it's um, because it's important but not completely determinative. determinative. Um, and then there, those motives also uh, create uh, certain kinds of systemic issues or certain systems in the industry about who's hired and not, who's listened to and not, which audiences are valued and which values audiences aren't. At every step of the media production process, this happens. Where color of change feels like it can play a unique and effective role is it getting in between producers and the media vehicles they would create to stop them from being created or to support good media and being created um, and put out there. Um, and we can also attack once the media is out there to interrupt the influence it has by trying to remove stuff that are, that's already out there or having a negative effect. This is one um, example of a campaign that we've run. Um, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, Oxygen began floating a pilot of a, a, a re so-called reality television show um, called All My Babies Mamas. Uh, so uh, reality television continues to be a wild, wild west when it comes to portrayals of black folks, as we'll hear um, from Jen Posner more about next. Uh, the banner of reality, even though we know that on most shows there's very very little reality about them, is providing cover to profit from exploitation without consequence. Um, this then impacts the rest of television and what's okay to do on television. It becomes sort of a vicious cycle, so our goal is to ex expose what's going on and to act. Um, so back a couple of years ago, Oxygen, in early 2013, Color of Change learned that Oxygen was promoting a new reality television program called All My Babies Mamas, featuring rapper Shoddy Lowe and his unconventional family of 11 children by 10 different women. They even gave the women nicknames like Fighter Baby Mama, Shady Baby Mama, Baby Mama from Hell, and my favorite, wannabe bougie baby mama. Um, within weeks of this announcement, more than 47,000 Color of Change members stepped up to say that degrading and dehumanizing shows like this are unacceptable. And after conversations with Color of Change campaign staff and hearing from thousands of our members, Oxygen Media executives made the right choice and halted production of the show, um, keeping the show from ever seeing a single minute of airtime. Oh, these are the mamas. Um, uh, Bravo uh, currently boasts the most affluent, educated, and engaged audience on cable. In April, millions of people tuned in to watch Real Housewives of Atlanta villain Kenya Moore uh, finally get the beating that she deserved, quote. The fight was promoted for weeks by Bravo following a redundant promotion formula. Calls uh, to the police were leaked to the press, usually radar online, followed by promotional teasers released by the network. And of course, the episode was reared for five weeks as Bravo cleverly lengthened the Real Housewives of Atlanta reunion season to include a three-part reunion, a secrets revealed episode, a husband's tell-all episode, and of course, multiple one-on-one -on -one interview specials with executive producer Andy Cohen on his late night show, Watch What Happens Live. Cohen, who in the past dubbed himself the biggest shit stirrer on the planet, responded by acting shocked and appalled by the physical violence um, and declared a no props rule for future reunion episodes. Um, in doing so, he continued to refuse to acknowledge both the disturbing pattern of violence across all of his reality franchises and the particular harm it perpetuates for black people. 
just a few days ago, um, only days actually, after, just a few weeks ago, only days after being reassured, reassured by NBC executives in the front office that no physical violence would occur in this year's, um, this season's upcoming Real Housewives of Atlanta, blog reports surfaced of a violent altercation on another Cohen Black reality franchise property, Blood, Sweat, and Heels. A bottle was allegedly cracked over one of the cast members' heads. Um, COC call, has called for and continues to campaign for an end to the physical violence on all of Bravo's black reality television shows. But violence isn't the only problem with Bravo's franchises. While everyone was focusing on the weave pool, um, you can take a look at, at this next clip, clip and check out the other representations of black women that were also present in that episode. Now, you get this a lot, right? People think that your butt is fake. Do they look new? Cynthia, from a sex-deprived husband to an uninvited house guest, this season your world was thrown for a fibroidian loop. But in true Cynthia fashion, you still managed to give us great hair and even better face. We actually got a lot of comments about your twerking. David from Long Island said, you ladies are two stops away from being 50. If Miley Cyrus is in her 20s, is it appropriate for women your age to be twerking? You know, I love to see penises that are oversized, as everyone knows. My current landlord did not have a right to try to evict me because I was not late on my rent. You tried to throw me out. Say hi. has a much smaller home than she was in before. But the real trip was she has this brand new convertible white Bentley outside and she said that her uh -huh. guy in Africa gave it to her. I'm not the one that had sex with a convicted felon. You gave me $700 a month. Because you were spending all the rest of the money on gambling and the home shopping network. <laughs> I want everybody to be here at what time? 11. 11. Oh, no, 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 no. That's unacceptable. I'm sorry. Once again, Phaedra, Candy, and Portia are late. Where is everybody at? You're late, bitch. You just got here. Am I late? Paulo, you have charges against you for bank fraud and identity theft. What can you say about your case? We're just going to let it play out. Oh, your vagina is so rotten, right, no one so will clean nice. you, oh. OK? Maybe you should stop being a whore, and I wouldn't call you me. Mm -hmm. That's your problem. OK. That is your I problem. I call him as I see it, a spade, a spade. Then you need to look in the mirror. What do you need me to do? Do you need me to you pull apologize. down your pants and kiss your ass? OK, then. I just told I you I like apologize. I like it when you kiss my ass. I just feel terribly that it happened. I really do. That was just a brief clip um, from the one hour episode, um, but uh, we cut out se seven minute, a seven minute segment on twerking, um, a full segment on CP time and the fact that black people can't be on time, um, as well as multiple segments on financial irresponsibility of several of the characters. Um, we see these same tropes, um, black people, oops, Sorry. We see these um, same tropes, black people as violent and dangerous, as bad parents, as financially irresponsible, repeated on local and national news. Recently, our partners at Media Matters monitored local news stations in New York City. They found that the four major broadcasting stations in New York overreported crime stories involving black people between May and August of this year. Late night broadcasts on weeknights cover murder, theft, and assault stories involving black people at higher rates than the rate at which African Americans have historically been arrested for those crimes in New York City. News media is powerful, painting a vivid picture of the world, um, its viewer, when, and when that picture contains an excessive emphasis on black criminality, it can be very influential in shapeful, shaping harmful racial attitudes. Um, according to UCLA professor and media scholar Travis L. Dixon, heavy exposure to black criminality on the news leads viewers to harbor an elevated fear of black people. 
subscri subscribe to the stereotype of black men as violent and intimidating and endorse punitive measures to address black crime, including quick judgment of suspects, tough prison terms, and a rejection of programs designed to counteract institutionalized racism. And when those perceptions are acted upon in the real world, young black people like Michael Brown, Renisha McBride, and Ramarley Graham can find themselves in the crosshairs of abusive police and racialist, racist vigilantes. Uh, we've been in contact with each of these, new, these stations in New York City to discuss these findings and ask them to commit to changing their reporting in crime. Several of the stations are committed to doing better, and we'll be working with them in the coming months to make change. Color of Change will also be publishing a report card on news coverage of black crime, and our hope is to see improvement in NYC news coverage that currently serves to dehumanize black people, especially black men and boys in that city. In scripted TV, um, we're in a moment where we're seeing a lot of progress with shows like Being Mary Jane, How to Get Away with Murder, et cetera, et cetera. And we'll see if this commitment to hiring black actors and showcasing black leads is here to stay, or if it's only a passing trend. Our work at Color of Change is not just about getting dehumanizing portrayals off, but also about getting humanizing portrayals on air. And we've worked with those inside the industry with the same in mind. Last winter, Color of Change celebrated the success of our work to hold executive producers of the television show Saturday Night Live accountable for the absence of fair and accurate portrayals of black women on the show. At the end of 2013, after pinning a powerful letter, later made public to SNL executive producer Lauren Michaels, we sat down with NBC Universal executives to discuss SNL's failure to address the exclusion of black women from the show. SNL responded to our concerns um, and to the comments of our members by hiring not only one new black female cast member, Shashir Zamata, uh, Zameda, but also added two black female comedians, um, who um, one of whom, Leslie Jones, is now a cast member um, from the writing room. The decision by Saturday Night Live to hire these talented black women was an important step in the right direction and shows that our members' voices were heard. Um, but that change was only allowed to happen after um, one of the cast members of SNL um, sort of messed up and um, blamed black women not being prepared to be on the show um, uh, for executive producers to change their mind. Um, we are also working with news directors, reality TV editors, um, and we're even starting to join writer's rooms of scripted shows to shift media before it goes on air and to work with content creators at the point of creation, not after the fact. We will also continue to attack harmful media once it's out there to interrupt the influence it has had and to demonstrate our power to those who have previously been able to continue this harm at no cost. Our, streets, our strengths come from combining a critical media analysis with mobilizing the public in rapid response situations, confronting media outlets directly and boldly, and advancing a system change agenda. And we're working toward a very different media landscape 10 years from now, where uh, characters like Olivia Pope um, and Mary Jane Paul aren't... Um, aren't extraordinary, but are more the norm. Uh, characters that are more full, complex, nuanced, and fresh. Um, the goal here isn't just to have positive characters of black people, but to have truly human people that we can identify with. We are combining all these different capacities to change the media landscape and its rules um, enough to improve black people's lives. Thank you.